Yeah. The lady in purple back there, please, first. Yeah, I, I just observed that as an educator, we, we've learned, or I have learned, I'll say, not to judge um, where a person is at, but the distance that they've gone from where they start, the distance that they've traveled. Yeah. And um, in some respects, the whole, this whole concept of making judgments about what's a good life, I, I find problematic because that's a judgment that we place on other people. For me, it's more important to have, um, you know, to teach young children from an early age to have the discourse, to make the choices, to make decisions that will let them decide what is a good life for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, yeah, and so you think that there's there's uh, nothing here which which can be really taught in the way of um, <clears throat> of setting up a target for the good life um, when you're dealing with children. No, I think the discourse can be taught. I think that the the um, the discussions and the well, the discussions around that can be taught, an approach, a method can be taught. You can engage them in a discussion on those sorts of things. Yes. Right? And this is the way to go about it. Oh, well, that's very Socratic. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, um, Socrates himself uh, said that he didn't really think this could be taught, this art could be taught. Um, and so... <laughs> so what are we going to do, Socrates? And uh, and his answer seems to be yes, indeed. Well, you've got, you've got to engage in in uh, in discussions, but it's got to be uh, carefully constructed discussions in which positions are taken and critically questioned, right? Mm -hmm. And you and you go from position to position as you critically <laughs> question them and that sort of thing. And then, then he thinks, and maybe he's totally <coughs> wrong, but he seems to think, or he hopes, and Plato did think, that um, this would inevitably, not inevitably, sorry, this would uh, hopefully lead to um, a considerable measure of agreement on the, the general character of what an excellent life is. Um, but maybe that's too much to hope for. Are you saying that that's not, that that critical part, that critical part that Martin just described that Socrates would use, that that's not something you would use with children? No, I'm saying it is something it is. you It is. Okay. No. Okay, Maureen? Well, I just, I've got a problem with this happiness gauge. You know, the idea of, of to live an excellent life, you have to be happy. And I just don't think that's true. I, I, I mean, again, happiness, is, it's going to be totally subjective, that definition. But, you know, someone that's enduring extreme poverty and war-torn type of life or, you know, they may have a, a degree of happiness, but uh, they can be living this excellent life by gathering the wood that will maybe make the fire to feed the children. And, and, and in, in my mind, I want to define that as an excellent life because I, mean, I know it's very simple, but I mean, we've got this idea of, What's going around my head is, is this Western idea of happiness. And maybe I'm wrong to say this, there's the third world reality. But it doesn't, it doesn't take away from them having an excellent life by, you know, their sacrifices and, and what they do just to get by every day. But I, I just got this thing. Yeah, so the, the question here is whether happiness should figure are you still in, in what is a, an excellent life at all? Yeah, well, um, especially with that. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, can't a life be excellent even though it's, it's lived in such circumstances that a person can't possibly enjoy it? Uh, they're constantly struggling against all sorts of uh, difficulties um, and uh, bad circumstances, etc. Um, all right, um, look. Maybe it's the case here that we need to make a distinction between uh, a 
an admirable life and an admirable person. Um, the, um, the admirable life, remember, is something we set up as a target for people to aim at. I mean, I think that like when a young person comes up to an older person and says, what should I do in my life? I've got to decide what I'm going to do in my life, you see. Right. Well, what you want to do is set up for them some sort of a, an admirable target. Now, I don't think unhappiness would be any part of that, that target. In fact, you would want happiness to be in the target. But now suppose they set out on that course, and then circumstances developed, which made it very difficult for them to achieve the goals that they had set for themselves, and consequently their life was was very difficult. Um, but they, they persisted against these unavoidable difficulties um, and, uh, and had uh, some measure of achievement uh, in, in getting to their goals. Um, I certainly want to say they're, it, it, they're admirable people, right? But the life considered itself doesn't match, doesn't come up as a target, right, uh, to be aimed at. It's got a lot of things in it which we wish weren't there, right? It's consumed by survival. Yeah. But now, <clears throat> um, uh, just a side comment, uh, when I talk to people who, who go to the third world, um, despite, I mean, of course, there are terrible stories of, of suffering and deprivation, Actually, most of the people I talk when they come back, they say, I've never met such happy people. Um, <laughs> uh, despite the fact that they are uh, operating under uh, what we would think of as great disadvantages, um, they, they seem to be uh, enjoying life uh, more than we are. All right. Um, so... I don't know, maybe this distinction between an admirable person and the admirable life is the way to, to meet the, the kind of objection which you're bringing up. Okay. I was going to start with uh, a statement that happiness is grossly overrated, but uh, one of the things I think that is key is that we all strive. There is always a hell up to the hill we have crossed. So uh, you could never be, from my point of view, you could never reach happiness. Because I always have a new goal as soon, before I even finish the old one. And uh, there is no point in having a definite, you know, this is the life. Uh, there is a point in developing the life. And in some time managing, you know, and say this is a, a goal, this is not a goal, and uh, making decision, but the idea in some way is what is important is a, the trial, if you want, or the achievement, or the attempt. Uh, the, the ultimate point does not exist, because we can always find another ultimate point. Uh, and I think uh, what kind of uh, development am I doing for my life in a way? You know, uh, the ability to continue to strive, and this would apply at any level. If I'm handicapped, maybe I can strive uh, to be uh, comforting to other people that haven't got a handicap. If I am Alexander the Great, maybe I can go to India and, and come back. Uh, if I'm Obama, I can do whatever I can in the position I'm in. In other words, there is a flexibility in, in our general goal, if you want. And those goal changes as, as we grow, as we live, as we interact with other people. And the fundamental principle, my happiness is not relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, other people happiness mm -hmm. or help I can give, mm -hmm. that is relevant. Mm -hmm. Well, hmm, yeah, all right, well, I'm going to throw it up. Yeah, it's the thing you get. Right at the back there first. Yeah. I guess for me the problem is that the thesis is just too narrow. Um, you have 
Uh, these guys are really preoccupied with what I would call citizenship rather than uh, uh, kind of human experience as an excellent life. So what they're looking for is like the citizen philosopher. So, and that's only, I think, maybe a quarter of what we are, our intellect. That's, and we can be moral and we can be uh, excel in terms of our productivity in society and still not be remotely living uh, an excellent life. I think Could you hold it there for a minute? Yeah, so he's saying that, that we can uh, be productive within society as, as citizens, right, and yeah. within the society, and, uh, and be accomplishing good things there, but be falling really very far short of an excellent life. And I think that because I think there are, well, I think three quarters of the picture is missing from the argument. I think that if you don't have a moral or uh, a fulfilling emotional life, if you don't have uh, a discussion like this without love in, as a function of an excellent life, I don't think can exist. And by that, uh, Kelly was saying, service to others to me, like the Dalai Lama says, that's an expression of love. Jesus Christ says charity, that's an expression of love. Those things are part of what make us whole and make us well as well as our physical nature, which doesn't even come up for the Greeks, really, except in the, in the form of games and such. But really, a person who isn't in their body, well in their body, is not likely to be well. And so, to, to, to ignore that in pursuit of the intellectual, we, um, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I've done that. I've played music to the point where I can't hear anymore. You know, so I've ignored part of my physical nature in pursuit of an excellence which, as this gentleman says, is always just a little further ahead than you're going to ever get. And that's actually a good thing. And the, third, and the fourth element that is missing from this discussion for me is a spiritual nature. You know, what profiteth a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So, it's just too narrow. I don't think I could be happy with the quarter we've been discussing. I need love in my life. I need to be well in my body, or at least working on that, and I need to have some connection to the cosmos. Then I can, I think, lead an excellent life. And that's, of course, what I'm trying to do. And I suspect it's what everyone is doing, whether they are maybe aware of it or not. We're all trying to put ourselves into that place. Nice. Um, did everybody hear that? Uh, it yes. was uh, yes. uh, in order to have a... Um, a genuinely excellent life. You'd, you'd have to have love in it. Um, you'd have to love the people you were doing things for. And uh, you have to have a spiritual side of it. That is, uh, see yourself as, how would you describe that? As somehow part of the general cosmos? I mean, there's lots of ways to describe that, and yeah. everyone has their own. But for me, at least, mm. it's an awareness of myself in the world right. and my relationship to it. And then you also emphasize the bodily aspect. You need a, a healthy body. Um, you need to pay attention to that. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, that... Uh, yeah, See, that's how we live lives of, of yeah, compromise. Yeah. Because if our only goal is intellectual, and by that mean intellectual morals, and intellectual successes, which is what we've been talking about. Yeah, I want to speak to the, the, the love part, because I didn't get to that in the, in the talk that I prepared. And that is, um, uh, all of these uh, philosophers, uh, uh, with the exception of the Stoics to some extent, emphasize friendship. Um, and uh, friendship is really a kind of love. Um, and so, uh, I mean, Aristotle thinks that it's, it's not just simply doing your duty as a citizen. <clears throat> Rather, you love your fellow citizens. Um, you're in a kind of friendship relationship with them. And this is what makes it so that you, you love doing things for them. Um, and 